guys, as we get back into the conversation, how do you address the challenges and the fears that often accompany evangelism? Yes, bloom where you are planted. We start with this. We have to start with answering the question, what on earth am I here for? So how do you encourage individuals who you're training or who are being trained by people you've trained embrace this mindset in their spiritual journey? So that is why we are taking our... Uh, we are not giving, for example, the Purpose Driven Life book and just throwing it, uh, although it is very attractive. Welcome back to the Ministry Growth Show. Today on the show, I'm going to be talking with Wahid and Lila Waba. They are co-founders and CEOs of For the Global Glory of God, or 4G3. Wahid, Lila, thanks so much for being on the show. Thank, Thank you, you for inviting us. Oh, yeah, pleasure. Ex excited to have you guys on to talk 4G3. Um, to get us started, can you just tell us a little bit about For the Global Glory of God, or 4G3 as we'll refer to it in this conversation? What's the origin story? Um, why do you guys exist? <laughs> Actually, uh, uh, 4G3 exists in order to embolden and empower um, Christians in the Middle East and uh, North Africa and beyond uh, in order to stay firm in their faith and to flourish where God has planted them. Awesome. And, and tell me a little bit about how the organiza organization got started. What, what was the, maybe this, Yes. Original well, we, promptings, the call, how'd that happen? Yeah, we started in the year 2000. Uh, we started in Egypt uh, with uh, what we called Middle East Leadership Training Institute or MELTI. And on purpose, we had no Christian connotation in the name because we work in all the uh, closed countries. And so uh, we started this together. We, uh, we, we did everything. We uh, translated material from the U.S., the best sellers. Uh, we edited, uh, we typeset, we <laughs> did everything together. So when we, when we started, uh, we, our vision was to saturate the whole Middle East and North Africa with Christian materials in the language of the people, uh, the Arabic language, uh, easy language to understand for everyone in this uh, region, and at the same time, life-changing uh, materials and uh, easy to apply. So this was the beginning in 2000. And uh, so God opened doors for us with uh, uh, Christian organizations in the United States, like. Uh, uh, walk through the Bible uh, uh, and um, with Saddleback Church having their materials, the purpose-driven uh, materials, uh, Crown Financial Ministries and other organizations. Uh, so we translated these materials and we started teaching them in um, a seminar format uh, for uh, as many people as possible in the whole uh, Middle East so we, we, at the beginning, we did the seminars and then we did publishing. So we published the Purpose Driven Life, the Purpose Driven Church, the Prayer of Jabez, Secrets of the Vine. I mean, the best selling, selling books in the United States at the time. And uh, uh, so we, we have the textbook and at the same time, we have the uh, uh, teaching materials, the uh, workbook and the PowerPoint all in Arabic. So we were able to uh, cover the whole 22 countries that are Arabic speaking countries in the Middle East. And furthermore, we were able to reach uh, Arabic speaking uh, people in uh, other countries, uh, in the Western European countries, uh, uh, North America, uh, and even Australia. Uh, so it's, a, it's a, a long story since the year 2000. Uh, actually, we, we were teaching people 
in person I, I am from that time until now. So the average number per year is about 45,000 uh, people. So uh, if you calculate it, and this is from the workbooks that are sold. The workbooks are sold in a very affordable uh, uh, price for the people in the Middle East, knowing that some people uh, are uh, really uh, cannot afford uh, to pay uh, the real price. So it is subsidized. But the actual number of workbooks that we sold uh, through the years is like average of 45,000 a year since the year 2000. So you see, Zach, it's like, you know, it's, it's just amazing when we look back because it's like your boss tells you to do snowballs and then God sends an avalanche and then your boss comes back <laughs> and says, whoa, how did you do that? It's like, I'm just as surprised as you are. <laughs> So in um, yeah. the last year when we were calculating like how many people did we reach and everything, uh, and this is uh, the, this number is very conservative because um, because you know in in the Middle East copyright means copy it right, and so it's like you know we actually the the workbooks that were sold are eight hundred thousand. But but probably it's it's over a million that we have trained face to face. But it's just like, you know, we are just as surprised as, you know, as anybody else who hears the number because we don't know how we did it. Wow, that's amazing. So there was you guys found that there was quite a large Christian presence in the Middle East. They were just desiring resources and training curriculum. And that that, that was a gap in the market if you will, uh, that yes. you were able to fill. Yes. The, uh, well, as new Christians, we suffered yeah. uh, from not having uh, follow-up mm. materials and mm -hmm. discipleship materials. So because of the suffering that we had with this, God led us to fill the gap and translate as much materials as possible. Uh, for the Christian uh, population. Now, you're talking about the year 2000. Now, things are different in the last uh, 10 years. W how, di how is it different? You know, the, uh, because of the what you call the Arab Spring, for the region there, it was not uh, a spring. It was a nightmare. Still mm -hmm. is. You, you, you can yeah. see what is happening in the region, all the wars and all these things. So uh, Christians left their countries to other countries. So there was displacement uh, internally and externally. Internally, I mean, for example, Iraqis uh, had to flee from the, uh, the fire of ISIS to the north, northern part of, uh, of Iraq. So this is internal displacement. But there is also external displacement like Iraqis and Syrians are uh, passing the borders and going to Jordan, Egypt, or Lebanon. So, uh, so uh, about 10 years ago, seven, eight years ago, uh, God led us to start going deeper with the people who are displaced. Because they have so many questions when this happens, when they need to suddenly leave their country uh, with the clothes on their back, literally, um, they and they need to leave because they are Christians. So they have like all these questions, like why did this happen to me? Why am I displaced with no home? Why, why did God permit this to happen? We felt that we needed to take what we were doing a notch higher, and we started what we call discipleship institutes which are 15 month a 15 month program where people um, uh, uh, study 10 core courses um, we just take like 35 people at a time train them for 15 months and in the 15 months every one of them is expected to reach a hundred others around them before they, they graduate and so we started that ripple effect of, of people who uh, have all these questions because people are very uh, open to the gospel when they're in transition. They are at a point where they mm -hmm. can like listen to the gospel. Maybe otherwise they would not have listened 
to it when they were in their closed countries. So they are more yeah. open uh, in the transition. Um, and actually through this, God opened uh, other doors. Like, for example, we didn't expect uh, our target was the Christians that are persecuted and that are leaving their countries. And our vision was to embolden them and enable them to uh, to understand that uh, what is happening is not by accident, but uh, uh, God allowed this uh, to happen. And at the end, God has a good purpose because God has a purpose for everything he does. So... When we started doing this, God opened doors not only with the persecuted Christians, but also with uh, Muslims who uh, to uh, turned to Christ uh, through this. Because what happened is some of the uh, Muslims in these countries started asking questions like, is this real Islam? Is, is, uh, is, is it all about violence and killing and uh, all these uh, terrible things. And so uh, at this point, we uh, met with people face to face who saw Jesus in dreams and visions. And uh, they did not know what to do next. Yes. So actually, like, uh, for example, I'm going to tell you one of the stories uh, was that uh, there is uh, someone who was in, in one of the close countries. He was in the military. And uh, he was to the point where if they would ask him to kill his mother, he would not hesitate. They, they trained him that well. Um, and then uh, one day he had a dream. He, he dreamt that there were two angels uh, who told him, uh, the road you're on will lead to death, but there's another road that leads to life. And so he woke up from the dream and he decided that he wanted to leave the military. And he went to his superior. He told him, like, I need to leave. He said, are you crazy? We're in war. You can't leave this. You know, that's not going to happen. But then he told him, I can give you 24 hours of uh, vacation if you give me money. So he went, he scrambled in, in demolished homes that they had bombed the day before found some money, found uh, some IDs of people who were dead. He went, gave the guy the money. He told him, you have 24 hours. So he had to pass through different um, checkpoints um, that were uh, uh, ISIS checkpoints. So he, he, he passed the first one, passed the second one, and third one, he was arrested by ISIS and put in jail. Well, the day that they were supposed to execute him, uh, they literally had the, the sword on his on his neck, literally, and and he said uh, a plane came and started throwing missiles and the chaos, and then suddenly he found himself somewhere else and he didn't know what happened. He slept, and the same two angels appeared to him again, and they said, "What do you want?" And he said, "I feel really thirsty." So he had not come to Christ at, the, at that point. So they told him, well, there's a little shack right in front of you. Go into the shack, but you will need to kneel down. And he said, why? They told him, you will understand, but the person inside will give you water to drink. So he goes into that shack and the light is so blinding that he, he kneels down and he sees two nail pierced feet. And, and he doesn't know. And then Jesus just lifts him up and gives him to drink. And he comes to Jesus. Well, that's amazing. He came to Jesus. Then what? That's where we right. come in. <laughs> because they don't know anything. They have no yeah. benchmark of, yeah. you know, about Christ. They haven't been to church. They don't know Bible stories. They know nothing. And, mm -hmm. and like this guy, there are, there are thousands and tens of thousands of people who have seen visions and dreams. And they go to YouTube to learn about Christ. So they get all the cuckoo things, you know, on YouTube. And so it's like, we, we really need to disciple them. So they'd be real disciples of Christ. Actually, when, mm. when things like this happen, you feel it's like, you know what? In, in the book of Acts, when, uh, when Jesus appeared to Saul on his way to Damascus, it, it, it's, this, it's the same thing. 
I mean, some of these people talk to Jesus and he talks back to them and he tells them what to do and what they are going to see. And, they, and he mentions, for example, uh, some verses from, from uh, the scriptures and they, uh, they recognize months later that they know this, this scripture because Jesus himself told them about it. Uh, uh, things like this. But exactly like Saul, when Jesus appeared to him, you know, he did not change immediately to Paul. He needed someone like Barnabas mm -hmm. to come along him, alongside with him, and to teach him the Christian life. Mm -hmm. So th this is what we are doing uh, uh, with our ministry in uh, in this area of the world. So it, it happens all the time. People uh, coming from either a nominal Christian background, like traditional mm -hmm. Christianity, and they know nothing about the Bible and they know nothing about uh, real Christian faith. Just like we were, we come from traditional Christian families and I was in, ca in Catholic schools, but you know, until we met Jesus, we didn't really know him. Mm. Or, or uh, people coming from a Muslim background and, uh, uh, you know, there is no forcing. I mean, the, we, these people are just asking uh, uh, about, how, uh, tell us how to, how to uh, follow uh, Jesus. Yeah. We, we don't know anything. And actually, they, not only they don't know anything, they have distracted uh, uh, distorted, I mean, they have distorted um, information about life, uh, about God, about marriage, about uh, uh, bringing up children. Yeah. I mean, you have to reprogram these people. Uh, this is discipleship. Right. So, so for example, uh, we went mm -hmm. to Iraq um, and we were doing the biblical portrait of marriage for um, 40 Iraqi families who are all Muslim background believers. And mm -hmm. uh, the first day we told them, we want every one of the men to tell three things that he loves about his wife, which is very unusual in Islam, because in Islam, like the woman is just a, an object, you know, just to serve right. him and stuff like that. So you, you could see all of the women got out there iPhones and started recording their husbands telling them the boxes. <laughs> I think they they left three inches taller after that thing. <laughs> That's right. And even if they were married for a long time, that was the first time yeah. in their marriage that uh, uh, the husband would say something positive or encouraging to his wife. Yes. <laughs> so yeah. it was such an experience. Uh, but of course. Uh, uh, I mean, the the biblical way uh, that uh, well we say that God is the one who invented marriage, and uh, and we of course we study the part from Ephesians five about the uh, role of the man and the role of the woman and the responsibilities of the man and the responsibilities of the women and how the deal with the different uh, issues, including the in-laws, because this is something uh, uh, very critical in, uh, in our uh, culture. So yeah, things like that. Mm, interesting. Wow. So can you guys explain how, how 4G3 maybe defines discipleship and what are some of the key principles that guide your approach? There's obviously uh, a firm belief in, in a, a role of training and curriculum development. Um, what does it look like as you have trained these believers who then are equipped to go and train others? Like what's the multiplicate multiplicative process? Um, what's the, what's the model behind that? Is it solely training and curriculum or is, or has that developed and grown over the years as you guys have grown as a ministry? I, I'll just start with something and then Wahid will complete because he has the big picture. But for us, it's like discipleship is life on life. 
Mm. So we are there for the long haul. We we that's why we do it for 15 months because it's they need not only to study because studying is in books. I mean, you can read all kinds of books, but they need to see us. They need to live with us. We need to laugh with them, cry with them, um, go to funerals with them, which we've done many times. And then they give us the opportunity to speak at funerals. So take care of their kids when they're there. There's a sick child that we can pray for. So it's it's much more than <clears throat> than just the curriculum. Yeah, so it's not about information. It's about transformation. And uh, uh, in our uh, uh, situation, uh, we use uh, Romans 8, 28 and 29. Uh, of course, Romans 8, 28, everyone knows this by heart. We know that... Uh, 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 everything works together for good for the people who uh, are called by God. But verse 29 is, why are these things happening? So, uh, good things, bad things, ugly things, anything that happens to us, any person whom we meet uh, in all circumstances, God wants to use all this in order to be transformed into the image of Christ so that we so that he would be the firstborn among many brothers so so this is uh, the core of it um, we do it as Jesus did it um, Jesus spent three and a half years with his maybe less uh, with his disciples, uh, spending all the time with them, eating with them, drinking with them, sleeping uh, in the same place, traveling together, uh, uh, performing miracles in front of them. Actually, we see miracles. Uh, it's, uh, we we're not talking about things that we are not uh, experiencing. We experience miracles all the time. Uh, we experience the uh, early church like Acts uh, 2, uh, 42 to 45, 47. Uh, and uh, through this, uh, growth happens and mat maturity happens. And what the end product that we want to see is a mature Christian who is rooted in the word of God and who is a continual disciple. So it's not a a course that he takes for 15 months and that's it. No, right. we are disciples for life. So mm -hmm. this is the beginning. This is the start of, but, uh, but then you continue all your life uh, learning from Christ, learning how to uh, listen to him and how to uh, uh, face different uh, life situations. Yeah. The one of mm -hmm. the amazing things that actually just happened in, in one of the countries we minister um, the refugees, we, we graduated 85 refugees. Um, and then these refugees, their lives were so changed that people, native people in the country where they are living, they said, we want to have what you had because we see the change in your life. And so those natives started asking us to go and train them and, and now we are in the process of doing two things. One is training those uh, refugees to be trainers themselves, which is also a very long and tedious program, uh, process. But we, we do it also Jesus' way. So we go and train and they watch us. And then we go with them. We train part, they train part. And we tell them what was good, what, was, what needs to be you know, uh, developed. Uh, developed. And then they do it themselves. And so it's like they have become so mature and so changed, transformed that, you know, even the local people are seeing the difference. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's just amazing, you know, because they are now that instead of being refugees, they have become a trainers to the locals whom, you know, you know, what is just lovely. Yeah, that's, that's cool. So is this, 
is this model uh, similar to a T4T or DMM type discipleship model, or is there nuance to what you guys are doing? Uh, it, it, of course, it's uh, more or less the same, but we, through the years, from the year 2000 until now, we were uh, able to um, uh, select uh, the 10 courses, and these co 10 courses build on one an uh, on the other, uh, so that at the end we reach the uh, results that we want to achieve, which is a mature Christian uh, rooted in the Word of God. And so we, we have not developed our own discipleship program. We have picked 10 best courses, for example, the Purpose Driven Life the, by uh, Rick Warren, Spiritual uh, um, Warfare. Warfare by Chip Ingram. Um, so we, we like we take the best um, Celebrate Recovery by uh, the Saddleback Church. Um, biblical portrait of marriage, if they are married, holiness in times of temptation, if they're not married. And so we just like selected the 10 best things and put them in, in you know, in order. Okay. And then like, uh, for example, um, survey of the Old Testament, teaching with style. So they know after that how to train in a way that is amazing. So we, we have, we, we thought, why reinvent the wheel? Like there's so much good material that we have the copyright and we translated it into Arabic. So why not use that? God does not uh, waste uh, uh, any uh, anything that we learned through the years. So we were making use of everything that uh, uh, that we learned through the years, and uh, and we of course uh, we are trying to develop all the time so that. Uh, from the feedback uh, of the people and from the results that we are seeing, we're trying to uh, uh, do uh, even better. So we, we are still partnering with new ministries and, you know, we just, we love partnerships because no one can do it on their own and we're all working in the same vineyard. <laughs> we're not in competition yeah. with anyone. So, yeah. yeah. Right. Now, how much did the, influence of those who discipled the two of you impact how you guys are discipling and training and leading the, the people that you're uh, investing in? That's a, that's a very cute question, actually. <laughs> so we were discipled by um, the navigators. Okay. Uh, yeah, for many years. And then after that, we continued with a... Um, Born again Coptic Orthodox priest who discipled us continued discipling us. Um, Interesting. So yes, yeah. yeah, so I mean, we love the long haul. We love the Word mm. of God. We know how powerful it is. We're still learning until today. Of course, no one finishes. No, of course, learning. yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we we are open to any uh, partnerships. Like we we. we we found a um, uh, uh, an organization here in Atlanta that is doing discipleship. And we are after this. So we translated the material. And lately, uh, we are in the process of uh, uh, producing another discipleship program uh, written in uh, by uh, Avery Wallace, uh, who is the father of the orality movement. And now, mm. it, uh, yeah, and now his uh, grandson Matt Wallis, who is a, a pastor in uh, of uh, a, a, a missions pastor in a mega church in Winston Salem, uh, he he worked on this material and uh, modernized it uh, in in mm -hmm. a way. So now we we're, we're in the process of producing this uh, another. Um, program that we started is uh, Impact Discipleship. Uh, uh, it's uh, four books that we did. We are trying to um, provide uh, as many discipleship materials uh, to churches in the Middle East and organizations uh, as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, we, uh, we, so there is a variety of things that they can choose from we can help if they want, or they can uh, do it on their own if uh, if they want. 
So, so here, yeah. when you go to a Christian bookshop, it's in the U.S. It's like you have so much stuff, so much. It's like we don't right. have this luxury in the Middle East. We do not. And so mm -hmm. we, like Wahid, always likes to say, we want to be the Home Depot of Christian ministry in the Middle East. <laughs> so if you if you need a course on parenting, you'll find on you know discipleship, you'll find on <laughs> Bible studies, marriage, like you name it, we we will provide it for you. <laughs> yeah. Now, how, how you guys have been going since two thousand? and you're based now and it sounds like in atlanta how much over the years of the growth of the ministry how much are you now delegating at your training to others that you have trained and mm -hmm. how often are you guys going and training yourself like going into country and and doing the handling the training yeah between we, the two of you we go we go back to the middle east uh like three to four times a year Oh, wow. And even when we are there, uh, we seldom teach. So we, we just attend uh, uh, different uh, events where uh, mainly graduation of uh, uh, discipleship institutes. And I, this is a funny thing. The graduation, after they study for 15 months, the graduation... Uh, the last graduation I attended was from 3.30 3 in the afternoon until 9.30 in the evening. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yeah, because everyone, uh, the, the graduation was, uh, there were 28 people uh, graduating, and each one uh, was assigned a, a, a part to teach from the, 15, from the 10 courses that they took through the 15 months. So... Uh, so he teaches uh, for 10 minutes and then the group uh, would critique the teaching and uh, uh, and they were so creative. You can't imagine. I mean, if Rick Warren attends something like this or Chip Ingram or Bruce Wilkinson or these people that wrote all these things, they would be amazed about uh, how these people took the materials and uh, with the the help of the holy spirit they were able to uh, present it in a very appealing way and a very attractive way and so so it's uh, it takes forever and everyone wants to uh, to share how this time the 15 months had uh, blessed him and his uh, work and his family and uh, everything so it takes forever we stop them <laughs> after six hours because <laughs> they can they can go on and on forever yeah but we yeah. we have an office in the middle east and it has 21 employees um so we do not need to be there um mm. uh, so and we have a training director and then we have a uh, people uh, local people in each one of the countries these are all volunteers uh, who either um, help teach or they um, help um, uh, with the uh, logistics of our going to train. Hmm. Now, offline, you, you guys use this phrase, uh, bloom where you're planted, and that kind of suggests um, flourishing in any environment. So how do you encourage individuals who you're training or who are being trained by people you've trained embrace this mindset in their spiritual journey yes bloom where you are planted we start with this we we have to start with answering the question what on earth am i here for why did god allow this to happen to me and my family why i i, I was displaced from uh, my comfort zone and now i am in a uh, foreign country and I'm starting from scratch and I'm struggling to live and, and, and endless questions. The purpose driven life answers all these questions and more. Uh, you are here for a purpose yeah. and God does not do anything without a purpose. God created everything in this world uh, for a purpose. 
all the more he created you for a purpose. So we are going to teach you in the next 15 months how to discover God's purpose for your life. And when you discover God's purpose for your life, you are going to flourish where God has planted because so many times, for example, in one of the countries we went, so we, we go and do house visits. And um, it's sort of like what you see in Jesus films. You know, you go to someone and you pray with them and read the Bible. So there are about five or six in a the family. Then we tell them, we're going to go and visit your neighbors on top. They say, oh, we'll come with you. So those five come with us and then they become 10. So one, you need to change the message or the part you're reading from the Bible. So you have to be very creative. <laughs> then we finish with those and we say, okay, we're going to your neighbors. And all these say, oh, we're coming with you. So by the time we visit seven or eight homes, we are about 50 people. <laughs> we're a church. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah, it's so funny. But the thing is that you see many of them are just in that place waiting. They put their lives on hold, waiting to go to the U.S. or to go to Canada or to go to Australia. or to go. Some of them have been there for five, six, seven years. And so the question is, what if you get refused? What if you never, ever get the okay to go to the U.S. or to any of those places? And, and they were just like, oh, that would be horrible. It's like, okay, what are you doing in the meantime? How will you let God use you in the meantime that you are waiting? Because don't waste this waiting time. Maybe God doesn't want mm. you to leave here. And so it's, it like opens, a, a, like there's a light bulb that goes on when, the, when, when we ask that question because they have never thought of that. Yeah. Interesting. Well, hey, I want to make sure that we take a moment to hear from today's sponsor. But when we get back, we'll continue our discussion with Wahid and Leila Waba for, uh, for the global glory of God. Hey, ministry leaders. Today's episode is sponsored by Click Nonprofit. Are you looking to grow your ministry but don't have the money or marketing knowledge to make that happen? There's good news. Google offers an advertising grant to churches and ministries that is worth $10,000 per month. This means that if your ministry is a 501c3 nonprofit, you are eligible to receive $120,000 per year in free advertising dollars. This allows you to place ads at the top of Google search results page and drive thousands of visitors to your ministry website every month. Our sponsor, Click Nonprofit, helps your ministry acquire this Google ad grant and then manages your Google ads to ensure you get the most out of the grant. Schedule a free consultation at clicknonprofit.com to learn more about how this grant can help your specific ministry. Mention the Ministry Growth Show when you sign up and get 20% off your first three months of management. All right, welcome back to the Ministry Growth Show. We've been talking with Wahid and Leila Waba uh, for the glory, global glory of God. And guys, as we get back into the conversation, how do you address... Uh, the challenges and the fears that often accompany evangelism, particularly in places where you guys are working, where there's diverse or maybe even skeptical environments and opinions um, related to the gospel. Yeah. Uh, when we share, people think that we, have, we, we, we are not afraid of anything and uh, that... Uh, uh, we know the way, and th this is not, tr not true. Truth of the matter is that we are afraid all the time. Afraid because of the changes that is happening by the hour. Mm. Afraid of losing opportunities to reach people and uh, save people before they get killed mm. or before we cannot reach them. I mean, uh, we, we have, I, I don't want to go into all these details, but let me tell you that we have uh, four discipleship institutes in Lebanon. Now the uh, old airlines banned the uh, flying to, to, 
to Beirut airport because the mm-hmm. Beirut airport is closed. And we we are we are we are crying to God, Lord, Lord, please, please. These people just started their relationship with you, and we know that you are in control. Please, please, we don't know. So this is the situation, you know. Uh, this is what this is. These are the challenges that we have. Yes, and that's that's why, like, when when people in the U.S. here like ask us, like, what's your biggest challenge, and and they would usually expect us to say that it's money but you know of course money is nice but honestly our biggest challenge is opportunity and time because we know that sometimes we go to a place and then this place gets closed and we can't go in anymore so this for example happened in syria we went to syria for six years we were going and having discipleship institutes and then suddenly syria closed and for many mm. years, we could not go back. We cannot even hear from the people that we've discipled. We don't know if they're, you know, firmly standing in Christ, if, if the, what they are doing. It's just, it's just, you know, heartbreaking. And then even now with all the wars and things that are happening, our hearts are bleeding that all these people are dying without Christ. It's like these people are dying without Christ. I mean, it's just it's just a matter of time and opportunity. We just want to need to run because there's very little time left. So the challenge is uh, urgency. Uh, there is a there is, I mean, I mean things are changing very quickly, and uh, we don't want to lose uh, people that. Uh, I do not know Christ yet. Uh, of course, uh, th- there are dangers, so we we always pray uh, for our uh, leaders who travel from uh, from Egypt, uh, from Jordan, and uh, uh, other places to uh, to dangerous places. Like there is a civil war in uh, Sudan, North Sudan, and South Sudan now. This mm-hmm. did not prevent us from going regularly and uh, following up with our discipleship institutes there, but it, it's dangerous. It's a, yes. it, it's not a joke. It's dangerous. Right, and right. and sometimes like you make a plan to go on a certain date, and then the 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 airport closes, so you need to readjust your plan to be able to go, or you you make a plan to go to a place and you're denied the visa. Uh, And so it's like, and then after that, they tell you, oh, the visa to this place is $680. It's like, what? Mm -hmm. So, so, I mean, it's like little things that, I mean, you need to be very resilient. You need to be very flexible. um, You need to think quickly. You have to be careful what you say, what you, what you, uh, what you do, like, one time, for example, we had we had a shipment, a five thousand dollar shipment, to one Oops. of the countries, and it was it was um, uh, it was confiscated. confiscated, and so we we lost a lot of books. And I mean, it's just like one thing after another. You have to be very creative <laughs> and very flexible. And of course, yeah, of course, money. Uh, we we work from the beginning since the year two thousand. We um, because Leila was a medical doctor, I was a dentist, we worked in the world and uh, uh, we know how it is. So when we started, we started as entrepreneurs. We did it on our own with our own money, but then things started mm. getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. So we cannot stop it. Uh, now, of course, there is an enormous need for uh, uh, financial needs course to sustain this ministry and to keep it growing uh, uh, as long as the doors are open and as long as the uh, the, uh, the there is a, still a day that we have to uh, work uh, on and uh, so uh, we're praying god is providing and uh, we are ex- it's an exciting journey i mean yeah. people who say that life with jesus is boring i 
That's not well, the Jesus we to, follow. To, to, tell you, to tell you the truth, sometimes <laughs> it's too much excitement. <laughs> <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Like we, yeah, we sure. always joke, and we always joke while he's and I that, you know, we feel God is running and we're trying to catch up with him. It's like, <laughs> you just, can you slow down a little bit? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you mentioned, uh, while he just in the beginning, this idea of um, the ministry, part of the existence of your ministry is to help embolden Christians in these places where um, there is a lot of persecution and, and oppression of, of those of the faith. Um, obviously, there's an urgency, you talked about an urgency to this. And oftentimes, uh, I know one of the other things that you mentioned was that oftentimes persecution drives people and disperses people into different parts of uh, in, in different countries into refugee situations. So what does it look like to help train and, and help these Christians, sometimes new believers, navigate being bold for their faith, uh, but also just depending on the Holy Spirit to see where he's leading and guiding, where, when do they stand and when do they move on? I, I'm, I'm really interested in that kind of um, what that looks like to train and equip in that space, the, the emboldening of believers. Um, does, does that make yep. question make sense to where well, I'm going uh, with that? Uh, can, I, can I answer this question with a story? Yeah, I'd love uh, that. So, okay, so we have, we have one of our uh, disciples who graduated. Um, he was put in jail. Okay. And uh, he owned uh, a very small textile factory uh, that is in a basement and um, literally like under under the stairwell literally and he had about 20 people working in that factory mostly women to save them from being um, sexually assaulted elsewhere okay well when he went to jail uh, of course the the factory closed all these people were without jobs uh, he uh, had a lot of uh, of legal debt, uh, and he was in jail for six months. But okay. during those six months, the rest of the disciples in the church who have also graduated with their pastor, uh, they started praying and you know asking the Lord for you know for help and stuff like that. And they would call Wahid, and Wahid said, "Well, you know, now this is the real test." Now this is the real test. And so two things happened. One is that the guy who was in jail, he evangelized people in jail, which was very, very dangerous because they beat him up like crazy and, and then they had to put him in solitary confinement. But at least those other people heard the message. And so that was one part. But the second part was that um, the people started asking God for, to uh, pay for the legal fees that, um, you know, uh, that happened. And um, God provided for the legal fees uh, through donors of 4G3. Um, and then we, we sent people, uh, two people from our, our office to that country. They uh, gave the, the legal fees we got much more than what we needed. So they gave the legal fees. They had a big party uh, that cost $200, invited everybody in church. They had a big cake with that man's face on the cake. And they even gave him money to restart his factory. And so it was a very big test of faith to see what, how they were going to depend on the Holy Spirit to deal with with their you know uh, with their contraption and so it's it's just amazing you know what God does. Mm -hmm. During this, yeah. of course, it was a, a, a testing of faith for us personally, mm -hmm. because Lord, wh why did this happen? Uh, and uh, the pain of uh, knowing that he is tortured in the prison and. Uh, we don't know uh, when he's getting out. There is no charges. There, uh, I mean, it's all a, it's like a mess. Uh, but what the best thing that came out of this is the 
the church there, the newborn church, yeah. united together. And they acted like the early church of mm. uh, that we read of in uh, the book of Acts. Mm. Yeah, I, on that church piece, I'd be interested to hear what church looks like in this in these contexts. These, uh, is it more like small little home church network type things, this, or more? Um, what we're accustomed to here in the West. How would you define or describe no, it's, churches it's over not, there? It's not the church that we have in mind here. It's more of a church that is uh, in uh, the book of Acts. So these people, most most of these people meet in secret mm -hmm. and meet after working hours. So, I mean, we, we talked about 20 people in, uh, in this uh, business but there are many others who work in, um, uh, uh, I mean, uh, businesses not owned by Christians. So they, they, because they don't have a work permit, they are in a transition. They are not allowed to work. So they have to work. So they are underpaid and they are mistreated. So to give you an example, they work, 10 hours a day, six days a week, and they get $200 at the end of the month. A month. Mm -hmm. uh, so and they when, work until like 10 in the evening. Yeah. So, so when, they, when they meet, we meet with them after uh, 9 o'clock in the evening when they finish mm -hmm. work. And we, the meetings sometimes uh, stay until 1 o'clock uh, after midnight. And uh, the meetings are in basements, uh in in summer it's okay uh, but in winter it's freezing cold in some of the places so that and they don't have they don't heating, have heating. Uh, so, one of the times like when uh, when our trainers went they said we were going to freeze there and Wahid said so why didn't you buy them a heater and they said, well, we didn't think about it. So later we, we sent a heater for that particular church because it was so cold. And then there are little kids, you know, the kids mm -hmm. have to stay up late because they, they have to be with their parents. So it's like the kids are also freezing and, you know, and they, they have like a special program for the kids during the training. So I mean, so this is, this is very it is. different. Yeah. Uh, they, they are concerned about their kids talking about the, the kids, they are concerned about their kids because uh, they are in public schools and in a different country and a different culture and all these things. And they are losing their own language into another language. <laughs> and, uh, and so we, uh, after, after, uh, all these uh, things happened, you know, we started uh, telling them, okay, let us pray about translating these materials into other languages, the language of the country where you are. At. And it's... Uh, That's our new project. Now <laughs> we want to translate uh, the 10 courses into the languages that the kids are speaking. So as they grow, we will have them in their new language. Yeah. Mm. Man, that's wild. So it is... You, you might have how I don't know ten or twenty tiny home churches meeting in homes and in small businesses. Yes, uh, yes. in an underground fashion, uh, in a region. Does that then, when you guys come in to train, or some of your trainers come in to train, are they coming in and training that regional church? Or are they training each individual no. home no. and the leaders no. in those e individual home churches? No, no. When we send people to go uh, and uh, and do the training, they we send uh, usually two or three people, like okay. the, like, like the biblical uh, model. So right. two se two seasoned leaders and one new leader with them to learn from them. So they go and they stay for ten days. And they meet with each of these uh, churches uh, uh, independently. They Individually, do not there's not place. like a seminar. No, no, no. Or it's, it's, it's all. No, it's it's too risky it, to do it's that. It's too risky. 
Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Wow. We, we even have, <laughs> we even have meetings where people in the same meeting do not know the real name of the other people in the meeting. So they have <laughs> nicknames. They have wow. nicknames so that if someone is arrested, he would not tell about the others. Snitch on the others, yeah. No, he can't. And then also, he for example, name. in Sudan, we have, we have a church that meets under a tree, and it's called the Tree Church, and it is literally under a tree because they have no building. And in the heat of the summer, of course, sometimes like the heat might go up to 107 or 110, they're still meeting under the tree. But they're hmm. they're so hungry for the word that they they don't care about the heat. Yeah, wow. What uh, what role does storytelling play in your ministry, and how do you guys incorporate it in your work? Maybe within your the disciple making process uh, or your marketing communications efforts. You've used story a lot, even in this conversation. So obviously, it's an important piece. To what you guys do how does that show up in in your ministry it's it's jesus's way of, mm. uh, of ministry and don't forget that jesus was a middle eastern <laughs> 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 that's part of our culture <laughs> storytelling yeah. <laughs> yeah so we we love stories this is part of the culture as Lila said yes and uh, it uh, it goes uh right into the hearts of people when they hear the stories of other people i mean mm -hmm. they identify with it and uh, they feel that it is uh, yeah i mean something live are you guys creating space inside of the disciple making process to explore one another's stories and and share one another's stories and and um uh, for the purpose of understanding why and how we relate to God the way that we do, does that mm -hmm. question make sense? Yes, like definitely. It, it doesn't. It doesn't sound like there's. It's just strictly curriculum con consumption and knowledge transfer. It, it, it this disciple making process goes a bit further than that. It sounds yes. like exactly. Yes. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. Yes. Everyone has the chance to tell their story during. Uh, we have like discussion groups and things like that. Uh, everyone um, shares. So we, we go really deep, especially when we uh, do the Celebrate Recovery uh, course, because mm -hmm. many of them have traumas because of what happened to them, either uh, because of the war or as they were leaving, uh, a few have been raped on the way. And so there are a lot of traumas and things so you really get to hear the stories when you do yeah. that course. Bitterness, mm -hmm. unforgiveness, and all this, all this. I mean, you could see uh, how the Holy Spirit works during uh, the teaching of these things, how he melts the hearts of people, and they repent, and they love their, their, their enemies, mm -hmm. uh, as the Bible says. So it's, uh, <laughs> let me tell you, we, we we even send uh, too many uh, newsletters, and our newsletters we seldom ask for money. We f we forget to ask about money because we are too much excited about what God is do <laughs> is doing. We just uh, share testimonies of people and uh, uh, how God uh, is working in the lives of people. Hmm. Well, earlier you mentioned uh, orality, and uh, I can't remember the name of the person that you mentioned who teaches Avery, that. Avery Wellis. So are you incorporating that training? In, I mean, you're working in an orality co communication culture already. Yeah, exactly. So is the training more supportive of what they already know with regards to their communication style or is this idea of orality within the context of sharing the gospel uh, a new idea, even in an orality cult communication culture? No, it's, a, it's not a new idea. This is how we are brought up. 
I mean, if you ask uh, a normal person in a, a church in the U.S., how many books did you read uh, from the beginning of the year until now, uh, he would tell you um, a book a month, two books a month, uh, a book every day, a couple of months. If if you go to the most intellectual people in the Middle East and you ask this question in churches or uh, anywhere, uh, they seldom read a book a year. Mm. Seldom read a book a year. So that is why we are taking our... Uh, we are not giving, for example, the Purpose Driven Life book and just throwing it, uh, although it is very attractive and they, they love it. But we teach the seminar the five purposes in uh, seven sessions, uh, first uh, an introduction and then uh, uh, a, a session for each of the five purposes and then uh, a, a closing session. With, with the teaching, we have a PowerPoint. The PowerPoint is colorful. The workbooks are colorful. So they fill in the spaces and they feel that they are connecting and we open uh, discussions uh, so they can contribute uh, during this and we uh, divide them into small groups after the teachings so that they discuss what they learned and share with their own testimonies. This might seem um, mm. very basic for the people in the US but this is uh, I mean that's that's amazing in the Middle East because most of the people don't read. So you think that it is time consuming here, we go to church, we expect the church uh, finishes in an hour or an hour and 15 minutes. If it's more than that, we look at our watches and then we, we see if our watches are working or not. Uh, but over yeah. there we have time. I mean, we, we, we have a lot of time. So the meeting would continue and then they, uh, after the teaching, they uh, go into small groups and in the small groups, they stay for an hour uh, after the, the uh, 45 hours of uh, teaching. And then after that, they fellowship for an hour. So this is the way it is. Hmm. Are these small home churches, are they meeting every night or just a couple times a week, once a week? What, what does that look like? It differs from one uh, uh, church to the other, uh, especially that they have, they don't have uh, solid teaching. I mean, here you have a, a pastor who teaches in the church, you have a, a, a small group pastor, you have, you have it all. <laughs> Worship pastor, right. youth pastor. Yeah, over there, the the leader i mean we don't we don't call him pastor the leader there is from a muslim background uh, so he his his biblical knowledge is very minimal mm -hmm. so they they gather almost every night and they worship together and they pray together but there is no teaching until we go and give the teaching okay or somebody else from your team comes or in and provides else, a yeah. Teaching. Well, now, now after working, for example, in in uh, in a country for fifteen months, we select out of the thirty-five people who attend the uh, the discipleship institute, we select three or four that we work with uh, 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 more deeply in order mm -hmm. to uh, equip them to be able to do what we do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's my next question is, are, do you find that leaders kind of rise to the surface? And as you identify those leaders that are rev being revealed either probably by the Holy Spirit, that then you, you look to teach and train and equip and come alongside those leaders that have risen to the surface exactly. and shown themselves to be strong, have strong leadership capabilities. Right. Yes, we have generations now. No, the, 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 the very dedicated volunteers, with, uh, we have 57 people who can do exactly what we do. Uh, uh, I would say f about 80% uh, uh, accuracy because they, they are in a learning uh, process. They, they, right. they will continue to learn. But we, you can rely on them, 57 people right now. 
Yeah. And so what is, this is more of a church related question, but within this, I mean, you're developing a home church network, essentially. What does eldership look like? Is is there just a, is the elder the leader of that home? And that's what that looks like in that context? Well, with, with, with the leader would be uh, a person who is like uh, two steps ahead of the others. Okay. In, in, in relation to his uh, relationship with uh, Christ and his mm-hmm. conversion. Uh, and his maturity, but but then uh, there are people who, through the training, would emerge as uh, potential leaders who can help with this leader. Hmm. So is there? This, yeah. I guess what I'm asking is there, like a glue that ties all these churches together. Uh, and a, a leadership structure, or eldership structure, or is that just non-existent in this context because of the way the church has to function, given the hostility that it's functioning in? Yeah, no, it, it doesn't exist. It, it is non-existent, and I, I do not see it in the near future happening, mm. and we are not worried about this. Because let, let me tell you something. I mean, uh, through what is happening uh, right now in the Middle East, I told you that we are sometimes very worried and we, ha- mm-hmm. we ourselves have questions. And, uh, but in, in all this, God is maturing our faith. Right. So that we depend on him, not on our leaders, not our, on our teaching, not on uh, anything else, only mm. depend on him. Okay. Yeah. It's not easy. I mean, it, it's easy to say, <laughs> but it's not easy to practice. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we are all learning. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's good. Well, Wahid, Leila, I've really appreciated this conversation and uh, have enjoyed spending time with you guys. If people want to get a hold of you, learn more about what you guys are doing, how can they do so? So um, they can go to our website. Uh, our website is www. the number four, the letter G, and the number three. dot org. So okay. www. dot four G three. dot org. Um, yes, so they can they can reach us this way, or they can send us an email um, at contact at four g three dot org. Perfect. I'll put your website uh, in the show notes so people can get uh, reach you and get a hold of you. Can I pray for you guys as we wrap up? Yes, yes please. please. Father, I thank you for this opportunity to talk with Wahid and Layla. Uh, thank you for. The amazing work you're doing through them, their leadership team through 4G3. I pray that you would continue to go before them, give guidance and wisdom and direction. We pray for protection for our brothers and sisters in the Middle East and all the things that are going on there, that um, you would continue to step into these situations um, to reveal how much you love us, how the lengths that you go to to um, reach us and pursue us and and invite us all into relationship with you, Father. Uh, I pray that uh, as much crisis as there is in the Middle East, that those um, situations would be opportunities for you to um, for people to come to know you and have a relationship with you, to be known and to know you, known by you and know you, Father. I pray for Wahid and Layla. Uh, that you would just encourage them, give them strength and wisdom and direction as they continue to lead this organization. Father, thank you for their willingness and obedience to um, say yes to the call you place on their lives to partner with you in this redemptive story. And thank you for all that you're doing through them and their ministry. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Wahid, Leila, thank you so much for coming on the show. We appreciate it. Thank Thank you, Zach. Zach. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you.
Thank you for listening to this episode of the Ministry Growth Show. If you've enjoyed it, we'd appreciate it if you rate and review us on your favorite podcasting app, and make sure you subscribe so you never miss an episode. If you have a story or expertise to share with other ministry directors and pastors, or know someone who would be a great guest for the show, let us know. We love connecting with ministry executives and sharing their wisdom and insight with our audience. Just send us an email at podcast at reliantcreative.org. And lastly, if you need help telling your ministry story, we would love to share how we can help in that process. Check out Reliant Creative at reliantcreative.org and book a call today. See you next time.